Hey everybody, in this video I wanted to talk about my visit to all eight of the Alaska National Parks. These parks are some of the most beautiful places in the United States and are exceptional examples of why places like these are worth protecting. I spent months planning my trip to visit all of these parks and I accomplished it in 30 days and so I wanted to make this video to help you to see these parks if that's something that you're interested in doing. A few notes before we jump into it, all of the cost information could change as it was based on when I went. I wrote blog posts about each of these national parks so you can read those if you want to learn more about each one and how to visit them. And lastly, if you want to go to just a specific park, jump ahead in the time code and you can learn about that park. Alright, I think that's it. Let's jump into the meat of this video with overall tips on how to visit Alaska National Parks. First off, where are the parks located in the state of Alaska? Here's a map that shows the entire state and I've noted where each of the parks are located. Only three of the parks, Wrangell, Kenai Fjords, and Denali are accessible by car. Honestly though, I would say that Kenai Fjords actually requires a boat to fully experience, other than the Exit Glacier hike. So it's closer to only two parks that are accessible via car. All of the other parks require to use a bush plane or some type of guide service to experience, so it does take a lot of planning to make the most of your time and to be able to visit some of these remote parks. Next up, let's talk a little bit about how to begin the overall planning process. These parks are a lot different than the others you'll visit in the United States, as most of them are massive at over millions of acres and they have almost no infrastructure whatsoever. You'll typically only see a few short established trails on the park map, and they'll all require you to be self-sufficient to truly explore them. Because of this, you'll really need to plan out your time and you'll need to be prepared to deal with anything when you visit these parks, such as weather that could stop you from visiting a desired location or even stop you from being able to be picked up if you were dropped off. Also, if you want to explore some of the hiking trails that are not on the map, then you basically have to be able to provide for yourself, you have to be able to know how to navigate these trails, and you have to know how to call for help if you need it. Because there's no cell phone reception in most of these parks, I picked up a Garmin Reach device and I did unlimited messaging for the entire time I was in Alaska. This is a satellite device and it allowed me to communicate with my family when I was in some of these remote locations and it actually worked really well. So that's a good option for you if you have people you need to communicate with or if you want something to help you feel more safe when you're in the backcountry. Lastly, as you begin the planning process, you should note when different campsites and things like that become available. For example, Katmai National Park's campsites are available in January, at the beginning of the year, and if you wanted to book the lodge, it's a year and a half in advance that you need to do that. This is the same for many of the different parks and their lodges, so if you want to do something specifically, be sure you're noting the date and you're setting yourself a reminder so that you don't miss it. One last note on planning, you really need to be in Alaska and have a home base if you want to visit a lot of these parks as they're weather dependent and you need to have a lot of time dedicated to it. It's hard to come up for the weekend, hit a park, go back home. So for me, I grabbed an Airbnb for about 30 days in Anchorage and I used that as my home base to visit all of the parks in this video. It's tough to do these trips if you don't have a place to relax after you come back from one of them. So that's why I grabbed the Airbnb. And now let's jump into each individual video, starting with the ones that you can drive to. All right, first up we have Denali National Park, which is the most visited national park in all of Alaska. Over a half million people visit this park each year, so you will not be alone on the park's few established trails, and you'll want to reserve your bus ticket in advance if that's something that you want to do while you're in the park. You can access this park in a few ways. First, you can drive in to the first 15 miles, which are accessible via passenger car, or you can take the bus trip deeper into the park, or of course, you can use a plane to explore a lot more of Denali. In terms of access, let's talk about the bus first as that's the main way that most people will experience the park. Note that a washout on the road a few years ago made it so that the bus doesn't go all the way to the end as it did in the video that I have posted in the description. There's currently no date for this to be fixed, and because of this, some of the drive's most beautiful parts are off limits until the road is fixed. Of course, you can still potentially see amazing wildlife on the bus ride, but without the end section, I'm not sure I'd want to do the 8 hour bumpy bus ride myself. Hopefully it's fixed soon and you can go all the way to the end, but of course if this is the only time you're going to be in the park and this is something you want to do, then you should do it. You can see the video of my entire bus ride in the description. Alright, next let's talk about taking a plane to Denali National Park. Flying a plane is a great way to visit the park as it allows you to see more of this massive area from above. The flights typically leave from Talkeetna, making them an easy day trip from Anchorage. You can book a plane from there that just flies over the parks for views or one that will land on the Ruth Glacier and allow you to get out and explore a little bit. If you want to see the park in this way, then I do recommend the glacier landing as it will enable you to set foot in the park and it's pretty impressive to see the mountains from this normally inaccessible glacier. 
Next, let's talk a little bit about what you can see when you visit Denali National Park. Of course, the main reason people visit Denali is to try to get a peek at the tallest mountain in North America. This mountain is notoriously difficult to see, and only one out of every three people who visit Alaska will ever see it. That being said, the Alaska Range has so many stunning mountains that with any luck, you'll be able to see many amazing peaks on your visit to the park, and hopefully Denali is out so that you can see that as well. The other thing Denali is known for is wildlife. The park is so remote with no established trails past the first 15 miles of road, so the ability to see animals here is pretty great. On an eight hour bus ride, we saw grizzly bear, doll sheep, caribou, and moose. It felt like we were on a safari, and I hope you get this lucky if you visit the park as well. Next up, let's talk about where you can stay in Denali. If you're planning on driving into the park, then the best place to fly into is Fairbanks. It's only about an hour and a half from Fairbanks to the entrance to Denali National Park. So you can stay there and drive in for a day trip, or you can drive down into the park and you can stay at one of the hotels that are right near the entrance. There's also a few campgrounds in the area, but be sure to reserve those in advance if that's something you want to do. If you're traveling from Anchorage, this is a very long trip as it'll take about four hours to drive all the way to the entrance to the park. If you do that, then I definitely recommend you spend the night so that you can have more time to explore after that long drive. Also, you can access the park via train from either Anchorage or Fairbanks, but that's not something I've done, so I don't really have a lot of information on that. If you're in Anchorage and you want to take a day trip, then the best way is just to go to Talkeetna and take one of those flights that land on the glacier. If you're in Fairbanks, then a day trip is a lot easier to drive down and do a couple of hikes and then come back. All right, lastly, let's talk about what it cost me to visit Denali National Park. Here on the screen, you can see a breakdown for the two visits I did to the park. As you can see, it's really expensive and it gets more expensive as we head to some of the more remote parks. Now let's head over to our next park, Kenai Fjords National Park. Kenai Fjords National Park is a popular one in the state, mainly because it's close to the town of Seward, which is where a lot of the Alaskan cruises leave from. The proximity makes the park accessible and it allows daily excursions from the cruises to be able to go and take boat trips into the national park. If you're wanting to access the park not on a cruise, there's two ways to do it. The first is driving in and the second is taking a boat trip. You can actually drive to the Exit Glacier Trailhead, which is right outside of Seward. This allows you to do a short, easy hike to Exit Glacier or a longer, more difficult hike to the Harding Ice Field. It's nice to be able to have this access point as if you don't have a full day for the boat tour, then you can come in and experience the park this way. Of course, the best way to experience though is to go on a boat tour. Boat tours are typically full day and will get you deep into the park to see the park's wildlife and glaciers. If you have a specific tour you wanna to do, I recommend getting it in advance as it can sell out in the summer. We went with major marine cruises and had a great time. You can see the full video in the description and do note that it can get bumpy. So if you get seasick, take medication before you get on the boat. Also, if you're staying in Anchorage and you don't have a car to get down here, you can take the train from Anchorage down to Seward and take a boat trip and then take the train back. My parents did that and they had a blast on their day trip. All right, let's talk about what you can see in the national park. And first up, it's wildlife. This park is one of the best places in Alaska to view sea life. It was even responsible for one of my most amazing wildlife experiences, which was viewing humpback whales doing bubble net feeding. The boat tour allows you the opportunity to see everything from whales and puffins to sea lions and even bald eagles. The boats are basically a full day and they're long and bumpy, but the experience is pretty unique. The other thing you can see in the national park is glaciers. Depending on the boat you select, you'll see one to three different glaciers on the trip. This was an easy highlight for us. Each of the three we saw were spectacular. Also, if you do the hike to Exit Glacier, you can see that one or the Harding Ice Field if you make it all the way to the top. It's an extraordinary park for glaciers. Next up, let's talk about where to stay and your best bet for staying near the park is in the town of Seward. We spent a half day in Seward and then spent the night in order to get up for our early boat ride the next morning. Alternatively, you can stay in Anchorage, but it's a two and a half hour drive each way and it makes it very difficult if you're going out on an early morning boat. In terms of the cost of this experience, you can see it on the screen right now. Since we spent the night in Seward, you have the hotel cost, and of course we have the cost for the boat ride. If you go to do Exit Glacier, you just need a National Parks Pass, so you don't really have to pay for that. Let me know what other questions you have on this park in the comments, and let's head on to Wrangell St. Elias National Park. First up, Wrangell St. Elias National Park is the largest national park in the United States. And if you really wanna see it, you definitely have to think about taking a plane flight while you're there so you can see more than just the small section that you can drive to. Honestly, the plane flight was one of the highlights of our entire time in Alaska. 
In terms of how to access it, most people will take the long drive from Anchorage. And I did have a few questions on car rentals. I'm not sure which companies allow you to do this drive. We drove a private vehicle, but I'm sure there's some local Alaskan car companies that will allow you to do this drive. And I know there's a shuttle service that can also take you in if that's something you wanna do as well. I'll leave those links in the description. For us though, we drove in and it's about a five hour drive from Anchorage to where you start the two hour dirt road to McCarthy. Even though the dirt road to McCarthy is only 60 miles, I would not plan on doing it in any less than two hours. So because of that, you're looking at a minimum of seven hours from Anchorage all the way to McCarthy. You can usually drive to the end of the road in a two wheel drive car with decent clearance, but be sure to check that before you go as weather can make it impassable. Note that this is a bumpy road and you have to pay attention while driving it. Alternatively, you can fly in on a short flight, but it costs more and it limits the amount of things that you can bring. So that's not what we did. Once you make it to the end of McCarthy Road, you have to park your car, cross the pedestrian bridge and either walk or take the shuttle to where you're going. Many people camp or stay in McCarthy and then they just take the shuttle up to the lodge, but we stayed in Kennecott Lodge. And so we took the shuttle directly there once we crossed the bridge. There's also a shuttle that runs between McCarthy and Kennecott if you wanna go back and forth while you're there, but it's only once an hour and it's a little bit difficult to plan for. All right, now that you made it there, what can you see when you get to Wrangell St. Elias? And the first thing that you can see is the awesome ghost town. The main thing you'll see in this park if you drive in is in the Kennecott area. So if you're staying in McCarthy, you have to hike to get there or you have to figure out the shuttle. Once you get to Kennecott, you'll first see the ghost town, which is one of the most picturesque human built things I've seen in a national park. Many of the buildings are open daily and free to visit, but if you wanna explore the mill building, you must book the tour in advance. I definitely recommend doing that as it's a fun tour, but the ghost town has plenty to explore and it's an enjoyable and historic spot in the park. The other main thing people do in the park is hike to Root Glacier. It's about five miles round trip and it takes you to the toe of the glacier. If you bring hiking poles and traction devices, you can actually walk onto it yourself and explore it to your heart's content. Alternatively, if you're not prepared with those devices, you can book a tour if you want someone else to guide you on the glacier. Either way, it's a fantastic hike and something you absolutely must do in the park. There's also some challenging hikes up to some of the old mines, but I didn't do that when I was there, so I don't have any comments on those. The last thing you'll want to see in the park are the glaciers and the ice fields. If you opt to take a flight, you can see a lot of beauty in the park that you wouldn't see from the main area you could drive to, including waterfalls, massive peaks, and the second largest ice field in the world second only to the one that's on Mount Everest. This was probably the most scenic flight I took in Alaska and it ended up being a massive highlight for both my dad and I. See the video that I did on Wrangell St. Elias to see more about the flight in the description. All right, let's talk a little bit about where to stay when you visit the park. There are a couple options for overnight stays in McCarthy and there's a campground there. But for us, we decided to stay at the Kennecott Lodge. The lodge was beautiful and it has easy access to the ghost town, so we visited often just popping over to see the sunset even. Also, the lodge has a restaurant so you can eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner there if you'd like, but be sure to bring your food if you don't wanna do that as there's only the lodge, the small store, and the food truck. Those are the only places to eat in the Kennecott area. There are a couple restaurants in McCarthy though if you stay down there. All right, now let's talk about the cost to visit Wrangell St. Elias. You can see the cost information on the screen. You can see the most expensive things we did was the hotel, which was about $300 a night, the scenic flight, which was also about $300 for a 70 minute flight, and the mill tour, which was $34 each. Totaling out to around $1,300 for this trip. Again, everything in Alaska is expensive, especially these remote national parks. Let me know if you have any other questions on Wrangell St. Elias in the description, and let's move on to all the parks that have no road accessibility. First up, we got Katmai National Park, which is one of the most amazing wildlife experiences I have ever had in my entire life. Do you know it takes a lot of planning to get to this national park? It was one of the most difficult for me to set up. All right, let's talk about day trips, camping, overnight lodge, all of the things you're gonna need to know to plan your trip here. First up, you're gonna need to decide day trip or where you're gonna stay before you plan anything else. If you're doing a day trip, that's a lot easier. You just pay for the tour price, do a full day from Anchorage, and that's all there is to it. If you wanna stay there, which you absolutely should if you're making all of the effort to get out here, then this is what we're gonna talk about next. Staying overnight requires you to decide whether you wanna do the lodge or whether you wanna camp. If you wanna do the lodge, you have to get in the lottery a year and a half before going. I was also told that the lottery has about a 15% chance of success due to the amount of applications, and if you get chosen, it can be upwards of $1,000 a night to stay there. To me, the best way to go is to camp, which does sound super sketchy with all the bears that live in the area, but I promise you it felt very safe when we were there. 
The campground is situated in an electric fence, and if you want to camp, it costs about $30 per person per night, but the campsites book up insanely fast. You have to reserve them at least six months in advance, and when I did, they sold out within 45 seconds. I was hoping to get two nights, but because of how fast they sold out, I was only able to get one, and I was thankful just to get that. All right, once you figure out how you're gonna overnight there, now you have to figure out how to get there. The easiest way is via flow plane directly to Katmai from Anchorage, but it was also the most expensive. We opted to take a commercial flight from Anchorage to King Salmon on Alaska Air, and then take a boat from King Salmon to Katmai. This ended up working out well for us and was about half the price, but again, it does require a lot more planning to make all the times work with the boat and the plane. And you need to book it in advance as there are limited spots on the boat and they book up quickly. You can see all the information on the boat company we used and the flights that we did in the blog post that'll be linked in the description. All right, what can you see in Katmai National Park? Well, first up, I just recommend you watch the video to see all of the bears and crazy things that we saw. But the main thing, of course, that you're gonna see in the park are the bears. This is the reason that people go from all over the world to Katmai, as it's one of the best, if not the best, brown bear viewing area in the world. We were there a little early in the beginning of July, but there was one time we saw over eight bears right in front of us from the platform. You get to watch the bears eating salmon and interacting with each other, and it's just such a unique experience. We even had a bear cross about five feet in front of us on the trail, and we saw them eating salmon less than 10 feet in front of us from the platform. These experiences here are honestly something I will never forget, and I can't even imagine if you get lucky and you're there when there's 10, 15 bears on the falls. The other main thing to see in the park is the Valley of 10,000 Smokes. This valley was the site of one of the most devastating volcanic explosions in the 20th century, and the destruction is staggering. You can see it via an all-day bus tour that takes you there for a short hike, or you can pay to fly over the valley. We had a limited time, so we paid to fly over the valley, and it was a fantastic but expensive way to see this surreal spot. Since this park is a little bit difficult, I wanted to provide a few additional tips to help make the most of your time here. First up, bring your patience. There are only a certain amount of people that are allowed on the platform at a time, so if it's full, then you'll get a beeper and you'll have to wait for your turn. This is one of the reasons to stay overnight, as you can visit when the day trippers are gone and it's rarely busy then. Next, the hike from the campground and lodge to Brooks Falls is about 1.5 miles each way. Because of this, it's a little difficult to just pop over and see if there are bears there. You basically have to commit to going and you're going to be doing a lot of hiking while you're there. Next up, there are things called bear jams in Katmai National Park. These bear jams are where bears sit on the trail and you have to wait for them to move before you can pass. They're usually only 15 to 20 minutes, but they can take hours if the bears don't want to move. This affects your time on the platform and it makes it difficult if you're trying to plan to get out to the platform or to get back if you're on a day trip. Lastly, everyone has to do bear school as soon as they arrive at Katmai National Park. This is about 20 minutes and it walks you through all the different safety things with dealing with bears and seeing them in the wild like this. Then once you get through it, you'll get a little pin that you have to wear the entire time you're in the national park to show that you did the school. All right, let's talk about costs. And this is one of the most expensive national parks we visited. Here's the cost breakdown on the screen and you can see that we did the flight and the boat, which ended up being around 750 a person. Doing the flight directly from Anchorage was about $1,200 a person. So it saved about $500 each, which is why we ended up doing it the way that we did. You can also see the flight to Valley of 10,000 Smokes was expensive, but I really wanted to do this as I don't know when I'd be back to the park again. Let me know if you have any other questions on Katmai National Park. This is something you absolutely should add to your bucket list if you're interested at all. And let's move on to Lake Clark. Lake Clark National Park is an often overlooked gem nestled in the Alaskan wilderness. The massive park is worth seeking out as it's full of beautiful lakes, meandering rivers, jagged mountains, and fantastic wildlife encounters. We only saw a tiny portion of this park, but the untouched beauty of Crescent Lake and its pristine shores is something I'll never forget. For this park, we just did a day trip, and here's all the information on our full day from Anchorage. Lake Clark is difficult to visit for longer than a day merely because it's remote and it's not as busy as Katmai, so there's a lot less infrastructure. Most of the day trips from Anchorage did not go to Port Allensworth, which is where the visitor center is, and you had to leave Homer for that, which was about four hours south drive. The Anchorage trips went to multiple areas in Lake Clark, and we ended up going to the one that went to Crescent Lake. Once the day trip was secured, we left from Anchorage and flew about an hour and a half over to Crescent Lake. It was a small five-seater plane and it had some great views out over the water and then eventually over the mountains as we got closer to the national park. The nice thing about arriving via plane is that you do get to see a lot more of the national park from above and since it is such a massive national park with millions of acres, being able to see just a little bit more from above as you're flying over is an added highlight. Alright, what can you see in Lake Clark National Park? Well, the main thing that you're going to see here are the bears. 
On most of the day trips, they're focused on seeing bears, and we got lucky and saw over a dozen on our trip. What makes it so special is that we just cruised Crescent Lake in a pontoon boat and observed the bears from afar, making it a relaxing and unique experience. We were there a little early in the season, so we didn't see them eating much salmon, but they were actively exploring and looking for it. The experience here is truly unique as it feels a lot more remote than Katmai does because so many fewer people visit. The other thing you'll see in Lake Clark National Park is the natural beauty. The beauty of Lake Clark and Crescent Lake in particular was especially memorable during our time there. We got great weather and could see across the lake, plus the lake had a stunning blue color and was surrounded by big mountains, including a 10,000 foot volcano. My mom even said that she thought the lake was more beautiful than Yosemite, which is high praise. As we cruised around the lake, we saw multiple waterfalls and even a couple glaciers, plus we saw a bald eagle when we were there. It honestly felt like heaven on earth. If you want to know where to stay in the park, I don't have a lot of great options for you since we did a day trip, but you can stay in Port Allensworth as there is some camping options there, and you can stay at the Redoubt Lodge, which is where our tour left from. This looked like an amazing place to stay, but I do think it is pretty expensive. All right, lastly, let's talk about the cost, and this one was easy as it was $1,200 a person for the day trip, which included flights over there and back, our time on the boat, and a freshly prepared salmon lunch. Again, it's expensive. All of the Alaska National Parks are expensive, so you do have to know that going in. Let me know what other questions you have on Lake Clark in the comments, and let's head on to Glacier Bay National Park. Glacier Bay is part of a collection of parks, including Wrangell and Kluani in Canada, that make up one of the largest UNESCO World Heritage Sites in the world. Most of the visitors to this park will come by a cruise ship, as it's a popular stop on Alaskan cruises. In terms of accessing the park, if you're going by a cruise ship, then you simply have to pick a cruise that includes the Glacier Bay portion. They only allow a few cruises per day to enter this area, so not all of them will go through Glacier Bay. We wanted to see the park up close, so we did more planning and took a few flights to reach Gustavus, where the National Park Visitor Center is. We flew all the way from Anchorage, which required us to fly to Juneau first, and then a 14-minute flight over to where the National Park was. We were then picked up at the tiny airport by the hotel shuttle and taken to Glacier Bay Lodge, where we stayed while in the park. Once we made it to Glacier Bay Lodge, there were hiking trails we could go out on, and this is also where the scenic boat tour left to cruise through Glacier Bay. I will say that it's a good half day to get there from Anchorage just because you have to take multiple flights and there's usually only one flight out of the national park per day. The main thing that you can see in Glacier Bay National Park is the marine wildlife. On our eight hour cruise, we saw so much wildlife, including breaching whales, different bird species, otters, and stellar sea lions. We also saw mountain goats on shore and even a bear from afar. The ranger on the boat with us said this was a typical day on the water for wildlife sightings, which is pretty impressive in a park like this. The next thing that you can see is glaciers. Depending on your boat tour, you may see one to three different glaciers during your time on the water. We only saw one because it was actively calving and we spent a lot of time sitting there watching it. No one on the boat was upset as seeing a glacier calve was a life highlight for me and well worth the entire trip to the park. Lastly, you can also see a lot of porcupines and sea stars near the hotel. Believe it or not, many porcupines live in the area. You will often see them while on hikes. I saw two while I was there. Plus, the tide pooling is great in the park, and we saw dozens of sea stars while walking along the shore. There's also a beautiful one-mile forested hike that you can often see wildlife on as well. In terms of where to stay, you basically have Glacier Bay Lodge, and I do highly recommend it. It was a great spot. It's relaxing, and it's a beautiful lodge right near the water. It has a restaurant so you don't have to bring food, and a visitor center for the park with rangers if you want to ask questions. There's also a campground that's about a seven-minute walk from the lodge, and a lot of people that I talked to loved staying there. Lastly, let's talk about cost, and you can see the cost information right here. The boat tour was $260 a person, and the hotel cost around $300 a night. It's about $20 to $30 a person for dinner, and about the same for breakfast as well. I used points to book flights, which is why I don't have any cost for that, but they're probably around $200 to $300 a person round trip for flights as well. Let me know if you have any other questions on Glacier Bay, and let's head to our last two national parks. Kobuk Valley and Gates of the Arctic are two of the least visited national parks in the entire United States. I put them both together in this video as it's hard to see people just visiting one due to the remote nature of these parks unless they're doing a backpacking trip or a rafting trip or something like that. All right, how to access the park is the most difficult part of this journey. Getting to the park is expensive and time consuming and the parks have no infrastructure whatsoever. There's no way around it when you visit these two parks you have to fly and probably on multiple flights. 
You can fly from a few places in Alaska such as Fairbanks and Delta Junction, but the quickest flight is from Kotzebue and that's what we decided to do. We flew out of Anchorage to Kotzebue on Alaska Airline and planned to spend two days in the town waiting for the weather to hopefully be good enough to allow us to fly into the parks. For comparison, you can also do this from Fairbanks, but it's about eight hours of flying to get to the two parks, and if you do it from Kotzebue, it's about four to five hours of flying to get to the two parks. Once you arrive in Kotzebue, you have to check in for your flight to see when they anticipate being able to set out based on the weather. Ours was planned for a couple hours after we got in, which allowed us to change our flight back to Anchorage the following morning instead of two days later. We explored the Park Visitor Center right across the street from the airport before heading out on our flight. They recommend that you plan to spend at least a few days here as you never know how the weather is going to be and since you took so much time to get here, you want to make sure that you can hopefully actually see what you plan to see. We got lucky, which is why we were able to adjust our hotel reservation and our flight reservation to go back early. The flight was in a 10-seater otter plane and we spent about two hours flying to gates of the Arctic. When we reached the park, our pilot touched down and let us have 30 minutes of exploring. Then we got back in the plane and flew about an hour and a half to Kobuk Valley. There we landed on the sand dunes and explored for a little bit before flying back to Kotzebue. Alright, now what you'll see in these two parks for your short little trip. Getting to the gates of the Arctic, we actually flew over other National Park Service land most of the way to the park, so we saw a little of the park itself from above. From what we saw, the park had lots of mountains and was stunning, with high altitude lakes and rivers running through the valleys in between. We landed at one of the most picturesque views I could have ever hoped for for our short time in the park. We got to dip our hands in the water and take lots of photos of the mountains that all looked like they actually formed a gate out in front of us, plus there was even some wildflowers that added to the beauty of the park. Heading to Kobuk Valley, we actually flew over more of this park than I anticipated. It had dozens of rivers bending as they made our way along the route, and it actually seemed relatively flat, with many trees and rivers instead of large mountains dotting the horizon. The sand dunes basically came out of nowhere and were such a small part of the park that it was confusing to even see them there. We landed right at the base of the dunes and could walk around and explore for about 20 minutes before we headed on. It was a lot more anticlimactic than Gates of the Arctic was, but it was still a beautiful place to see and it was still fun to check off another national park. In terms of where to stay, if you fly into Kotzebue, there's basically one main hotel there. I'm sure I'm probably mispronouncing it, but I think it's Nolgavik, and it was an excellent spot to stay. It was a nice hotel in the middle of the small town and there was a restaurant and an observation area that you could sit at while you were waiting for your flight to leave the next day. The town has a grocery store and multiple restaurants, and if you travel in the summer, be sure to stay up and see the midnight sun as well since you're above the Arctic Circle. In terms of cost, this is easily the most expensive of any of the national parks that we visited, and you can see it on the screen. It costs about $450 a person to fly from Anchorage to Kotzebue, then the flights into the national parks were $1750 per person. Then we also spent around $275 for our hotel in the town, leading to a grand total of around $4,000 for this trip. If you do it from Fairbanks, the flights are generally more expensive since you have more time in the air, but that is an option where you might be able to tack it onto your trip a little bit easier. Let me know what other questions you have on these two parks in the comments, and that's it for my massive Alaska National Parks Guide. I'm sure there's lots of things that I didn't cover, so be sure to ask any of those questions and go to the blog posts because if I forget about something, I'll update the blog post since I can update this video. Hopefully you enjoyed going on this Alaska National Park adventure with me and we will see you on the next video.